Now, Samuelson Says. Insight and commentary from Orion Samuelson. A few days ago, Reuters carried a story from Cuba talking about the communist government of Cuba taking another step to make it a little easier for Cuban farmers to produce, sell, and market their food. But still, with liberalization, Cuba imports 60% of its food. And very little of that comes from the United States, just 90 miles away. Why? Because in 1962, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy and the Congress of the United States said, we'll take action to force Fidel Castro out of office and do away with the communist government in Cuba. We'll impose a trade embargo. We will not do any trade with Cuba until they get rid of Fidel Castro. Well, Fidel Castro is still alive. He is not in control today, but his brother Raul is in control. The communist government is still a part of Cuba, and we still can't sell agricultural products to that country just 90 miles away. So I say once again, trade embargoes do not work unless you control entirely the production of the product. When we took our steps to embargo trade, Cuba could get its wheat from Canada, soybeans from Brazil, rice from Vietnam, poultry and pork products from France. They really weren't hurt that much by the embargo, but American producers were hurt by that embargo. Now, we have taken some steps. Cuba can buy food if they pay cash up front, but we could be doing so much more because Cuban people love the Texas long grain rice. They love our beef and other products. And dairy farmers in Cuba love our Holstein genetics. But they can't get any of that because of the trade embargo. So it is time, Congress, to end the embargo with Cuba. My thoughts on Samuelson says. Well, with our over a cup this week, we welcome a friend, Kerry McGinnis from Kentucky. We want to get the story on tobacco from you momentarily, but just a moment. I heard something the other day yeah. that in Wisconsin, there are 65 dairy breakfast events scheduled this month. I, is that more than usual? You would know. I don't think so. I think it generally runs between 60 and 70 and uh, there are some of them that will attract up to 5,000 people. Well, I heard of one that took place just a couple of weekends ago, yeah. and they had 7,000. That was in the eastern part of the state. Might have been Brown County, I'm not sure. That's Green Bay. 7,000 yeah, right. people attended that dairy breakfast. Of course, they have petting zoos, and yes. you know, you can... Uh, and they, ice uh, cream oh, for breakfast. Yes, a breakfast buffet. All you, all you can eat at some of these, I understand. Yeah, at a minimal price, too, because the idea is to get people out to look at a working dairy farm, to enjoy it, but to sit in the tractor cab or a combine cab to watch cows being milked. It's a great education thing. Well, they've gone on for many, many years. And yeah. of course, I think there was a little problem when uh, there was concern about spread of disease right. onto some of the farms. They were but concerned they about that. But sort of got over that, so. Are there agricultural events that take place in Kentucky sometime during the year where folks try to share the story about agriculture? Absolutely. In fact, just in the last several months, they've had a lot of different farm tours in our part of the state of Kentucky, and we celebrate June Dairy Month as well. In Western Kentucky, where I live, there are several events that'll go on throughout the month of June where we'll celebrate ice cream, and I'm always looking for a good excuse to do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I was surprised how diverse agriculture is in Western Kentucky when I was there. I was amazed. Well, I knew there was corn production, soybean production. Tobacco isn't gone. It's not going away. In fact, conventional wisdom would be that after the tobacco buyout in the mid-2000s that it would have been on the decline. But that was only the case for one year. After the tobacco buyout in 2005, there was a bottom out of the number, uh, the amount of poundage of tobacco grown in the state of Kentucky, right. but it has increased or held steady every year since. In fact, we're back up to pre-buyout levels in the state of Kentucky. Foreign Second, demand? Yes, much of that foreign demand, but also for the dark fired. You know, we all know that the number of people who smoke in the United States is continuing to decline. When it comes to that burly export, 
people in China are smoking more than ever. But when it comes to the dark fired in Kentucky, that is seeing sort of a resurgence as well. A couple of reasons. There's a perceived notion that there's a lesser health risk when it comes to the smokeless tobacco. Uh, the chewing tobacco. Right. So more people are actually turning to that. Also because smoking is banned in so many public places now, more people are turning to that more discreet means of getting their tobacco fix. So we're not seeing a decline in the amount of production in dark fired in Kentucky at all. In fact, it's growing. Why do they call it dark fired? Well, after once it's in the barn, of course, the difference between the air cured and the dark fired, that dark fired, they have the sawdust underneath in the barn, and that's mixed with a number of different things to give it that aroma that comes up mm. through the tobacco in the barn. And it's dark in there? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 it may be, but no, <laughs> the, the tobacco to begin with. Right. No, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and some of those are quite large, aren't they, those barns? Yeah, the barns are. And what's interesting about that industry in particular, at least for me, I, I grew up in Illinois originally. And then when I moved to Kentucky, I was one of those Yankees, as they would call us, right. that started to call 911 at one point when I saw smoke billowing from a barn in Kentucky. But that's a sight that you see there pretty frequently because of the dark fired tobacco. But the barns are different sizes and it depends on the size of the operation. Well, it's very interesting. I, I was surprised because I, you know, the natural assumption was that all of the producers had converted over to something else. Many did, right? They started producing uh, livestock or growing other crops? Yes, things that are less expensive to produce. Tobacco is very expensive. Very labor intensive. Very labor intensive. And that's... I know. I know. <laughs> you were one of them doing the labor that's at one right. point, weren't you? Yes, yes, it's expensive and it's labor intensive. So what's happened is that some of the smaller tobacco farmers have moved away from tobacco and more into corn, soybeans, wheat. But the larger tobacco producers have gotten bigger. So your, your big guys are getting bigger is what we're seeing in Kentucky. And, and what that means for the industry is that there's a more consistent quality. Some of these big farmers, they've got the labor, they've got the equipment. If something breaks down, they just move on to the next piece of equipment while they get that one back up and running again. So it allows your bigger farmers to stay in it. And it allows for a more consistent product. Which the processor wants. Your, your processor wants, that's right. So they continue to get those bigger contracts because your end user knows what they're getting. There is a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ori. Well, uh, uh, I want to move on to hemp for a moment because I know they've done, but you got another tobacco question. No, I, I just was making note of the point. There is a big processing plant right there in your neighborhood. Yes, right? actually, U.S. Smokeless Tobacco is located in Christian County, Kentucky, in the western portion of the state. That's owned by Altria Group, largest producer of smokeless tobacco in the nation. So a lot of that dark fire, again, the reason it seems to be on the rise in our part of Kentucky is because there's that end user right there, easy to get to, and they all also are growing. They're about to spend $118 million on a plant expansion and add nearly 50 jobs. Sounds like that market's not going away then. It's not going away anytime soon. Now, what about hemp? You've just passed a law in Kentucky? Yes, it's very small. It's in the early, early stages. It's a pilot project meant for research. Part of the reason that a lot of our Kentucky lawmakers didn't start as a lot, it was a few lone rangers there for a while, but it built steam over the last few years. Part of the reason they were looking for hemp as a product for us in Kentucky is they felt like for our small tobacco farmers who we talked about who are no longer growing tobacco, it would provide an alternate crop for them. So this has been something that for the past six, seven years, they've been working on in Frankfurt to try and get passed. The governor wasn't real sure about it for a little while there. Then Rand Paul jumped on board, Mitch McConnell jumped on board, of course, from our, uh, congressional, uh, our congressional delegation in Kentucky, and, and that helped it to pick up some steam. But in these infancy stages, there are only 13 acres that are being grown in Kentucky. And it research only. Research only, that's right, Orion. It is so that you have to have a permit in order to grow it through the USDA. You have to go through a background check. A convicted felon cannot grow hemp at this stage of the game in the state of Kentucky, and you can only have one acre. And each of them are tasked with a different type of research project. Some are working on the fiber, some are working on the oil that comes from the hemp, and some are working on the seed. For instance, my friend Joey Pendleton, one of the champions of hemp in the state of Kentucky as a former senator has an acre himself on his farm and he told me that his research project is to work on the byproducts of the seed as cattle feed.
Really? As cattle mm. feed. As livestock feed, yes, sir. Must each of those plots be fenced in? I'm just curious. Is, you know, I don't is, know is the answer to that. Any security now there are there is a security measure in place in that you have to allow access to law enforcement. Oh. So if someone wanted to come in, if the DEA wanted to come in and take a look at your one acre plot, you have to allow them access to do so. I wonder if they're going to count plants. I wonder. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if it does grow to the industry that a lot of, well, hemp producers in other states, North Dakota, that have been, It'll be interesting to see if there really is that big a market for the product. Everything from the medications that can come from the oil, anti-seizure medication is a big push right now, granola bars, car parts, dashboards in the automobile industry, all of these things are byproducts of hemp. And so we're hoping to see it grow. One other interesting point I thought you all might appreciate is this. There's been a lot of talk in the early stages of these conversations that this would make it tough for law enforcement mm -hmm. to spot marijuana and eradicate marijuana. Police what, officers had had opposed it. They it? had. They had for that very reason, thinking that it might complicate things when it comes to marijuana eradication. The difference between marijuana and hemp, they look different. If you were to look, you'd, you'd see there really is a difference in their appearance. But also, the hemp has no THC, which is the agent that causes the high. What happens when they are cross-pollinated is that the hemp ruins the marijuana product it lessens the THC, lowers the THC in that marijuana. So if you're a marijuana grower, you don't want marijuana. hemp anywhere near your product. <laughs> Interesting. It is. We learn something every day. <laughs> and we hope all of you do too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Maybe you. We can see you again here with us sometime, Carrie. We Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Have a good week, Orion. You too.